Welcome to the Cultivation Cast by Black Dog LED with Kevin and Noah. In this podcast series, we will cover all things related to indoor cannabis cultivation. Welcome to the Cultivation Cast by Black Dog LED with Kevin and Noah. In this podcast series, we will cover all things related to indoor cannabis cultivation. So we've gotten some feedback from our listeners, and we definitely appreciate that, but we definitely like more thoughts on what you'd like to learn about or topics you'd like us to cover. Just shoot us an email at podcast at blackdogled.com. This will allow us to make sure to cover the topics you care about. Again, that's podcast at blackdogled.com. Thanks. We look forward to receiving your feedback and comments. So this week, um, we decided we'd cover a real high-level overview of a grow, kind of from beginning to end. So we've got our grow-alongs where you can spend you know, a couple hours watching an entire grow over weeks and weeks and, and see it all in a video. We thought we'd kind of summarize what we cover in those grow-alongs. So we're going to start at clone, go all the way through to flower and kind of into harvest, and just talk about the high points and the, the basic things you need to, to understand or to accomplish with your grow. Keep in mind, we're not going to do a deep dive into anything such as like how to feed your plants. That We have another podcast we did a few weeks back where we cover nutrients, and that's a, it's a whole separate topic. But for this, we will touch on as many of the main points we can. And of course, if there's something we haven't covered in a previous podcast and we mention it and you're curious about it, Send us an email and we'll make sure and do an entire podcast on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our growing style. So again, there's hydro and there's all kinds of different growing styles out there. But what our kits are set up for and what a lot of our R&D is done in is soil, or as Kevin would point out, it's actually peat moss. And we'll cover that in a moment, what we're really using as a grow media. But we're going to stick with that. So keep in mind that if you're doing a different grow style or a completely different way of growing or method, it might be different and and our advice might not be perfect for you. So just keep that in mind. Um, We're going to kind of look and contrast a small, very small grow for a home grower, like a two by two space. And then something a little larger, like a four by four, where you can get some real production out of it. And we'll talk about the differences in those. But there are a lot of similarities. Most of the things apply to both, but there are a few few nuances that we will point out along the way. So let's dive in. We're going to start with the cloning process. And so for those of you not familiar with it, the point of a clone instead of a seed is you have prediction of the genetics you're working with. You know, you have a known entity you're working with. You're taking a cutting from an existing plant. A was it Kevin? It's a donor. What's it technically called? The donor plant is your name for that? Or is that the scion I'm thinking of for grafting? You're thinking of grafting. Grafting the scion. So in any case, we'll just call it the donor plant. And and cannabis, most people are going to call it the mother plant. So you take a cut off that, and you're going to clone it. And now you're going to end up with a plant that's theoretically genetically identical to the plant you started with. So now you know it's maybe a good producer. It has the smell or flavor profile you want. It's going to be a female, which is critical if you didn't use a feminized seed. So there's a lot of advantages. And let's just spend a minute talking about what cloning is. Kevin, do you want to walk us through real quick just some high-level stuff about how you go about taking a clone and getting it through the rooting process? Yeah, I mean, there's many, many different ways of cloning plants, uh, different types of plants. Uh, have different requirements in terms of what you need to do to successfully clone them. But for cannabis plants, they're actually pretty easy. Uh, In fact, it can be as simple as cutting off a branch and putting it in a glass of water. And about 80% of the time, if you change the water regularly, it'll actually grow roots for you in there rather than rotting. Now, it's not the best way to do a clone, but it just points out exactly how easy cannabis really is to clone. There's some other kinds of plants out there that uh, are very difficult to clone with any known methodology. And in fact, there are some that are even resisting efforts to uh, micro propagation, but uh, cannabis is not one of those. So the easiest way to clone a cannabis plant is just to take a uh, section of stem off a mature plant. <clears throat> you don't want to take a immature, uh, really, really soft growth, but you want something that uh, isn't woody either. It should have nice, firm, green stems to it as opposed to starting to get bark on the outside. Uh, you take a cutting off of that, so you cut off uh, at least two to three nodes or uh, leaves included on a single cutting. Uh, very carefully slice the end of the uh, stem off at about a 45 degree angle just to help maximize the amount of area that you're exposing to rooting hormone and then dip it into one of the commercially available rooting hormones. There's various different forms. There's powders, there's liquids, there's gels. I tend to recommend the gels because they're by far the easiest to use, uh, especially with cannabis plants. And uh, they're... uh, 
readily available everywhere. The powders can be a little bit tricky and messy. The liquids can be a little bit messy. And if you get the dilution wrong, you can cause problems. Whereas the gel is just, you buy it, you stick your cutting in it, and that's all it is. So it's the easiest way to do it. Then you want to put it in a sterile uh, environment. They sell uh, rooting plugs or rooting blocks of rock wool, both of which are very good. You can also just use regular soil, but you want to use something that's relatively clean. You don't want to be taking a pot that you just uh, took another plant out of that has potentially insects or mold or any other thing growing on it, and then just immediately try and put your clone into it. It's probably going to cause you problems. So you want to start off with a clean pot or or clean, sterile uh, rooting plugs or rooting blocks of rock wool and stick your cutting into that and then put your cutting in a warm environment where it's going to get at least 18 hours a day of light. We don't want to cause these uh, clones to actually go into flower while they're supposed to be growing roots. So you want to give it 18 hours a day of light, but it's very, very low light levels. We don't want to encourage this clone to actually try and grow anything other than roots. So we want to give it just enough light to keep it awake, which is about typically 50 micromoles per square meter per second. We talked about uh, PAR and intensity and PPFD a couple of uh, podcasts ago. So it's about 50 micromoles, 50 to 100 micromoles per uh, square meter. It's what you want. And then you want to give it as much humidity as you can. So there's a lot of different ways of doing that. You can buy uh, what they call cutting trays that actually have a plastic top for them, kind of a plastic dome that goes on top. I've also for years used uh, 10-gallon aquariums, which are very cheap at a lot of the pet stores. Uh, Just put a piece of saran wrap over the top, and that makes a perfect humidity dome as well. But somehow you want to keep the plants such that they don't have drafts and they maintain as close to 100% humidity as possible because until that cutting grows roots, it has no way of getting additional water into it other than if you spray the leaves down. But if you're constantly keeping the leaves wet, they'll grow stuff you don't want to grow. So you want to keep the humidity as close to 100% as possible so that the plant isn't losing water to the air. And then keep checking on it. After about 10 days to two weeks, most strains will have roots. Some will take a little bit longer, but when you actually see the roots poking out of the rock wool cube or the uh, potting, the rooting plug, then you know it's time to actually pot it up into a larger pot. So that's great. And one thing I'd like to hone in on that I've learned from uh, watching Kevin and some other growers who I appreciate their skill is if you want the take, you'll hear people talk about their take rate, their success rate. And as Kevin said, throwing it into a glass of water, you might get 80%, you know, on random again, depending on the genetic and how easy it is to uh, root. But one thing, if you want to get that really high take rate, 95, 98%, maybe even close to 100, it comes down to sterile, clean environments. You spoke about that. I can't emphasize that enough is I always hear growers that are new and they say, wow, at first, first time I did cloning, I had hundred percent, everything took, and then it started to decrease. And now I'm down to 75%. And you ask him, say, great, you're, where are you doing your cloning? What, what are you using? And they said, well, I'm using the same thing I've been using for the last five times I've been cloning. And they don't, <clears throat> they don't realize they need to sterilize that equipment. They need to, you know, whether using rubbing alcohol or uh, hydrogen peroxide or something or a disposable thing, if you, if you're okay with throwing something away. Um, but definitely cleanliness is key for that. So now you've got a clone, as Kevin said, that's showing roots out of the plug. And now our next step is to get that potted up and get it into veg, get it under real light and get it moved over. So let's talk about that transition, what needs to take place, maybe what you have to worry about and cover there. So while they're cloning, they're getting very low light levels and they're in extremely high humidity. The leaves will actually get used to that high humidity level and the little pores on the bottom side of the leaves called stomata actually get relaxed and lazy because they get to stay open all the time in a high humidity environment. So if you just take that clone and you put it straight into your normal grow room, it's going to be going from a low light, high humidity environment to a high light, low humidity environment. That oftentimes will cause shock. So you want to make that transition as easy on the plant as possible. Uh, Any way you can that you can slowly over a period of 12 hours or 24 hours decrease the humidity from 100% down to what you're actually going to be growing the plant at, uh, which should be about 45 to 50% is about ideal. 
that's what you're going to want to do. So, for example, with the commercially available clone domes, they usually have a little vent on the top that you can start opening up and slowly open those vents up over time to let in more fresh air and decrease the humidity. If you're doing something like a 10-gallon aquarium with a piece of plastic wrap over the top, you just start peeling the plastic wrap off very slowly so that over a period of 12 hours, you're exposing the plants to more and more of the air. In general, uh, with our lights, at least, if you're moving from 50 micromoles up to a 200 to 400 micromole uh, light intensity level, we don't see too many issues with light shock for that. However, it can vary. If you're cloning under, for example, fluorescent lights, and we do get customers that comment on this all the time, and I've seen it personally. If you're cloning under fluorescent lights and you move from fluorescent lights straight to a spectrum that actually has ultraviolet in it and is quite a bit more intense, such as our Phytomax 2 lights, then the plants can suffer severe light shock and the, the leaves may actually... Um, turn down, try and get away from the light. They can demonstrate signs of bleaching, things like that. So what you'd want to do there is start off by moving your clones off to the side of your main grow environment, not straight under the middle of the light to begin with, but start them off at the side or raise the light up a little extra and then slowly acclimate the plants over a period of one to two days to the higher light level. Yeah, we often use other plants to shade them as well. If you've got some big mothers, you can kind of stash the plants under there and use a little bit of shade there. Um, Kevin, would you say, you know, we've talked about it with a lot of customers, with the veg situation where you've, you've got people with their mothers and then they're going to clone and put those under lights, I would say that even not only what you clone them under, but the light, the plant, sorry, but the light the plant was originally under, the mother plant, the donor plant that that clone came from, would affect a little bit the ability for it to recover because if it came from that spectrum and had been growing under that, that would affect it, would you say? Yes, but uh, two weeks while they're in the cloning environment is long enough for the plant to start getting used to the new environment it's in. That's why even though the majority of the leaves it has when you take it out of the clone at the end were fully acclimated to low humidity when you put it in, they get unacclimated to that and they get acclimated to the high humidity environment so even though it definitely does help to go from the the same light the mother was under back to the same light the mother was under uh, as far as shock if you put them in an environment where they're getting dramatically different light for the two-week cloning process you still need to account for that a little bit. Yeah. One other thing that I'd like to point out, too, I mentioned potting up the clones earlier. And uh, it's awfully tempting to just take your cute little clone that's in a, a cube that might be one inch across and plop it into your final seven-gallon pot that you intend to flower in. But the problem is you've got a little tiny plant with a little tiny root system that you're now plopping into a giant vat full of soil. And you, when you water that in, it's going to take forever for that little tiny plant to actually go through all of the water in that soil volume. So it's actually oftentimes the place I hear from customers that they're failing is they're actually going from a very tiny pot or from a clone straight into a very large pot. And then it causes the roots to rot because they're just not drying out quickly enough. It's very important actually to go into a smaller pot unless you're really, really skilled with watering your plant and only watering it just right around the root ball and being very careful not to overwater it. And you can develop those skills, but it's much easier and always much safer to simply pot the plant up into an appropriate size small pot. Generally for clones, I would recommend either a two inch or a four inch pot to start. And that's exactly why with the kits we do, some people ask, why do we have so many pots with our kit? And there's four of every kind. And because we believe in that, the sizing up of the pots, whether it's going from clone to veg or veg to flower, or while you're in veg sizing up and growing up your plant, you want to size these pots up. So for example, with our kits, they come with a four inch pot and then we go to a one gallon. And then depending on your final size of pot, if you're in one of the bigger tents, you know, you might end up in a five or seven gallon pot, in which case you'd have another intermediary step between the one and five, you'd go to a three gallon. So we provide all those because it is a better way to grow and you end up with a better root mass. And as Kevin said, an easier to manage garden with less likelihood of overwatering. So th that is a critical stage or a critical step that you want to pay attention to. And again, we see all the time people going from a solo cup, our favorite, to a uh, seven gallon pot. And then they wonder why they're overwatering or why their plant just isn't growing. And it's just completely yellow and overwatered. So it is a common problem, and 
uh, we always say the most common mistake of beginner growers is overwatering, over loving the plants. So that's a good way to do it is oversize your pot. So now we've got plants that are theoretically they're acclimated to our veg environment. We're going to go ahead and pot them up from their root plugs, throw them in, like Kevin said, into one of the four inch pots or five inch pots, get them into soil here. And we're going to do that and then keep them in veg. And so again, our veg is the same place we've had the mother if, if that's what we're running. So we've got 18 hour light cycles, what's going to make it veg, not flower. And then we're just maintaining, as Kevin said, proper humidity and temperatures in there. And we're going to stay in there. Now, how long do you stay in veg? That's a very common question. And we get it all the time when people see R&D and they see the flowers are like, well, how long do these veg for? And the answer is it depends. So it very much depends what you're trying to accomplish in your garden and what you're doing, as well as the genetics. Genetics grow very differently. Some shoot up fast. Some are going to slow growers. Um, we've got one that, that roots incredibly fast, but is a slow grower. That makes sense, but it's just the way it is. Um, so they're all different and they all have their own differences. However, we can give some rules of thumb. So for a larger plant, what we tend to go towards with something going into, let's say a five or seven gallon pot and like a three and a half by three and a half or a four by four, or five by five tent, you're going to get to real legitimate large scale plants. We're going to go ahead and do that in maybe six weeks, maybe eight if it's a slow growing, but generally we're going to be somewhere inside of eight weeks and around six. Now, if you've got a smaller tent and you don't need to veg as long, you might be vegging for only two to four weeks. So there is some room to play in there. And let's talk a little bit about during that veg time, what we're doing, because there's a lot going on. A lot, everyone talks about flower, but to bring really good, healthy, well manicured plants into flower, there's a lot of work you do in veg ahead of time to allow you to then get those great yields that you can really get out of your flower space. So during that, we're going to do a few things. We're going to top. We're going to do, uh, we're going to maybe clean up the undercarriage a little bit. We're going to do a lot more of that in flower, but we're going to keep the plant clean and healthy, but we're going to do heavy topping across the board. What we're trying to encourage there is branching and we're trying to increase or per- create a level canopy so that when we get into flower, we get good light exposure, have a nice level canopy and a lot of tops. And let's talk a little bit about what that means for top and how do you select a branch and really how do you accomplish this yeah and and just to reassure everyone out there we're only covering our methodology that we generally use for growing that we find works the best for us there are different ways of of doing it and for example if you're running a sea of green it may be that as soon as you pot your cutting up you give it a, a few days of veg time to acclimate and then you flip it into flower in which case you don't want to be doing all the topping and trimming and everything else that we're going to be covering. But for our methodology, where we're trying to keep the plant count reasonably low, about four plants at a time, um, it really works a lot better to have each of those plants be as bushy as possible. So if you don't top a plant at all, it's going to naturally develop what is called the uh, central leader through a process which is known as apical dominance in plants. So when you think of a traditional Christmas tree shape, you've got one central branch that is the top of the tree that is always growing up. And then all of the other side branches never even really try to compete to be the top. They're being actually hormonally subjugated by that top growth, which is producing a hormone called auxin that actually drops down. It's heavier than water. So it's actually sinking in the plant and it's suppressing the growth of all of those side branches so that only only the central leader is actually growing through apical dominance. By destroying apical dominance, by chopping off that central leader, we actually encourage some of the side branches to start growing. And then if we go back a few days later or a week or two later and we cut the tops off of those, then we get encouraged even further uh, side branches and additional tops for the plant. And in terms of what that means for your cannabis harvest, it generally means that you're going to get a much larger harvest per plant. Now, if you didn't top at all, you'd end up with a really tall cannabis plant with one really big cola on the top and maybe some small ones down at the bottom. But it's going to be really big up at the top and you're going to have really small ones at the bottom. By denying the plant that central leader and by giving it 20 to 40 branches that are all going to be roughly the same height at the top, you're not going to get one giant bud. You're not going to get 40 giant buds. Instead, what you're going to get is 40 medium large buds, which are all going to add up in weight much larger than what you would have gotten from that one giant bud 
off a plant that you hadn't topped. So we're encouraging the plant to distribute its resources around to more than just a single flower uh, bud, more than a single cola. And in doing that, it's going to cause all of the colas to get a little bit smaller, but you're going to end up with way more total weight at the end. So we want the branchiest possible plant that we can get. And that's the purpose of topping and training during veg is to encourage as many different side branches to grow as possible. Now, in order for all of those to compete equally with each other so that you don't end up with one giant one and a bunch of little ones. We all want them to be at roughly the same height. So it's not just a matter of encouraging the plant to get as many side branches as possible, but we want all of those side branches to be at roughly the same height. And that's actually easier to do than it sounds because For example, uh, coming out of a clone, you might have one single central leader, one single central branch that is growing tall. And by pinching out the top of that, it may encourage three to five, depends on the genetics, two to five even uh, side branches to actually start growing up. Once those grow up enough so that we have at least two to three nodes, two to three leaves that we can get side branches out of, then we can pinch out the tops of those and keep encouraging the plant to keep sending out more side branches. Now, while we're doing that, generally don't strip the the branches that are coming off the very base of the plant, even though they're not at the right height, if they have enough time left in your veg process that they might be able to grow up and get to the appropriate height as the rest of the top branches, then we leave them on. If they're clearly bending over, broken down, not uh, being able to support themselves, or they're just not going to be able to grow up to that same level, it's probably better to actually remove those lower branches entirely, no matter when you see them during the veg process, because the plant is putting energy into that stem that it's not ever going to use because we'd want to chop that out during flower anyhow. And that's a critical thing is talking about the the plant has a finite amount of energy. And with our lights, we always talk about that our spectrum will keep the plant shorter. Again, a lot of the reason we want to do that is we want to divert that energy towards the things we care about, such as growing flowers, not stems and leaves and things like that. So we try and do as much as a much as much of that with our spectrum as we can. And as Kevin said, there are other ways you can do that, such as stripping things out and removing things that are going to just rob of energy from your plant that has a finite amount of energy. It can pull up through the nudes or from your nudes into the soil and get your plant growing. So we want to divert as much of that into flower production as possible. Yeah. So our whole goal during the vegetative growth and training process is to create a plant that has as many branches all at the same top level so as many branches as possible that are all competing to be the topmost branch of the plant think of a uh, good military haircut the old flat top you're really trying to give your plant a perfect flat top that you could set a level on we always say you know we go into like the three light guys into their grows you could lay a level across their giant rooms and it's just perfectly level across it's amazing. So if you take care, it seems difficult at first and it does take experience. As Kevin was saying, you, these are skills you acquire over time and you can get an amazingly flat canopy even across multiple plants in a giant room if you're an expert and very good at it like those guys. So it's something to shoot for. And then one other thing, while you're doing all of the topping, it depends a lot on the strain, but some strains, especially in the central area of the plant, as you keep topping the plant, You're getting a whole bunch of new growth out at the outsides that is good. That's what we want. But it's also encouraging the central branches in the very center of the plant to start uh, branching out so much that oftentimes it can become very congested in there. And if the branches are so congested, they're really fighting with each other for light or even air space that's not a good thing either. So oftentimes we end up thinning out some of the branches in the middle, even if they would theoretically pass all of our other criteria for in terms of being at the right height, being good, strong branches. Sometimes you have to cut some out just so that you end up with an even distribution of the branches across the entire flat top of the plant. 
So let's talk about frequency a little bit. You know, Kevin's talking about all this topping we're doing and all the method, but how do you know when to do it? It's a lot of it is just looking at the plant, obviously. But so you know, I mean, if, if you've got a room with maybe six or eight plants or even four plants in it, you might go in there and literally pull a top off every single day. You could wait and do it once or twice a week. But from watching it being done by people who are very good at it, you find, I believe, you get better results doing a little bit every day so you don't end up with these big runners that you're trying to cut back larger chunks. And I think you end up with a better, more manageable canopy if you're in there every one to two days and really trying to re-level out the canopy. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, it's... um and all the time you end up getting distracted and you don't have time and you just water the plants real quick and run off to work. But, and then you have to come back and pull the plant out and spend 30 minutes cutting all of the individual branches back down so that you get a nice level, even canopy. Whereas if you do spend just a couple of minutes a day when you're watering the plants or when you're checking on the plants, if you're just pinching out the topmost uh, branches as appropriate. It makes the plant actually grow better. I think it does result in a better quality plant than doing it less frequently. Um, and it makes it a lot easier on you as well. You're just uh, cutting down or, or pinching out a few branches a day. And it it seems like it be, would be difficult. And it's one of those practice makes perfect things. After doing it just a couple of different times, you'll get the hang of it and understand what you need to pinch out to keep your plant canopy nice and level and even. So as Kevin was saying, you know, we what we have is these plants that you could flip right away so they don't have to do any topping. But let's assume we've got plants that we've been running through. We've taken them all the way through and they've been being topped for two to eight weeks. And now they're at the size we want. We've been sizing them up. And just to point that out, as we talked about sizing up your pots, how to know when to do it is a watering thing. The plants will tell you, one, you might see, depending on what kind of pot you're using, you might see roots coming out the bottom. Um, but really what you're going to see is the dryback cycle. Is you know, our target when we're in flower is every two days, three at the most. Now, nothing is worse than having a ton of plants in a garden that will drought stress less than 24 hours. So I would say that what you're looking for is to get to a point where once you're breaking, you need to water them more than once a day, you need to transplant at that point. Ken, what's your rule of thumb for that? Yeah, it, generally, if it needs to be watered more than once or every one or two days, then it's probably time to transplant. Just having roots out the bottom of the pot does not mean that it needs to be transplanted. Plenty of plants will send roots out the bottom of the pot and still be drinking only th every three or four days. Uh, but once it starts getting to requiring water more frequently than you're willing to give it water, then it's time to size it up to a bigger pot. You don't want to jump up to a massive pot, though. You don't want to go from a one-gallon pot to a seven-gallon pot if you can do an intermediate size, it will be much better for the plant. It'll force the plant to grow its roots into that new smaller volume of soil, the new slightly larger volume of soil rather than what you had, but still smaller than the end result pot that you want to be in. Because if you put it in too large a pot to begin with, it's going to remain too wet for too long. The roots aren't going to actually fill up the entire soil volume. They're just going to bolt out to the edge of the pot and then start circling it again. And you're not going to get as good a root system as if you slowly size it up over time. And then in terms of figuring out when is appropriate to actually flip the plants into flower, because we're giving ranges because it depends on a whole bunch of different things, including what strains you're growing, as well as what size you've got uh, to flower them in and a whole bunch of different things. So a good general rule of thumb is we want to get the plants so that they're large enough and not height wise, but width wise, so that they're filling up about 75 to 80 percent of their final area that they're going to get when they're in flower. So let's talk about that real quick. As we said, the whole thing is trying to figure out what you're trying to accomplish, right? You don't want to grow in and grow giant plants if you're about to go into a two by two. So as Kevin said, you're trying to hit 75, 80% of the space. So we talked about early that we would cover kind of a two by two and four by four, and this is a good time to kind of contrast those two. So in a two by two, each each plant is going to have one square foot if you're going to put four plants in there. So let's assume you want you know, 75% of it, you're going to want it to be about eight inches across instead of 12. Um, so you're going, no, that'd be actually nine, inches. Be nine inches. Yeah. I'm using, I was going two thirds. Uh, so if you're nine inches across, 
at that point, that's a good time to go ahead and move it into your flower and flip it into flower because another rule of thumb that's handy is your plant's going to about double in size roughly. Now, that's not exactly correct, and it's going to be different for every genetic, but a very common mistake we see not about, we, we do believe that overwatering is the most common, but a common mistake with cannabis specifically is people don't anticipate how much the plant is going to grow from the time you flip it to the time you're going to take that plant down. And you can't slow a plant down. I guess you could. You can turn the temp down or give it less light, but now you're just hurting your yields. So the goal is to bring in a plant that's the proper size that's going to get to the size you want at the end, as Kevin was saying. So that's really something, again, it does take a little bit of practice, uh, but and it also is helpful to know your genetics. Another, another reason cloning is helpful is if you go from seed, every seed's going to grow differently and you're going to have to kind of relearn every time. It might be similar, but with genetics, once you're cloning, it's going to be kind of the same kind of growth every time you go through flower with that plant. Yeah, so the total amount of time spent in vegetative growth is dictated by strain. It's dictated by the amount of room you've got for flower, how many plants you're going to put in there. But when you're 75, 80% of your total area, um, that's when you'd want to flip into flower. Now, Noah mentioned that we're trying to grow plants as large as possible, but we're also trying to grow them as short as possible. There's no point in having the plant expend a lot of energy on long, lanky stems. And those are actually only going to cause you problems later on in flower because they're more likely to break or to bend and cause issues on you. So we try and keep the plants as short as possible. And by aggressively topping them during vegetative growth, we definitely get that nice, short, squatty plants that have very uh, nice flat tops, very branchy. And we end up with, and again, it depends entirely on how long you've if you are only aiming for a plant that's eight inches across, it's probably not going to have 40 tops on it. But we want as many tops as we can get in the time it took to get up to that size. Now, if you're uh, flowering in a six by six foot tent and each plant is getting a three by three foot area, then, yeah, 40 tops might actually be a bit, little bit on the low side of things. So really just depends. But it's a, a general rule of thumb that you can apply uh, across any size grow is to wait for it to be about 75 to 80 percent of the total size it should be width wise not height wise so now we've got plants that are been topped like crazy we've been sizing up their pots appropriately and now we're in our final pot size or we let's say you don't have space a good trick is to do your transplant as you're moving into flower get to your final pot size and just let them settle in for a few days anytime you transplant we haven't talked much about it you're going to have some shock I mean, there's, if you're good at it, and I've seen some good people where they get very little shock, but you are still disrupting the plant. If I rip your, your feet off, you're going to have a little bit of a weird time when I move you to a new environment. So in this case, we want to give them a little bit of time if we're transplanting right before we move into flower. But if we've got our plant already in our pot, we can throw it into our flower space, and now we can start flowering. And so as we talked about before, the only difference between veg and flower, we might want more light intensity, but the real difference is the duration of your day length or actually your night length in this case. So we want to drop it down to 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness from the 18 that Kevin spoke about before that we were running in veg for clones as well. And we're going to go to that 12 and that's going to start the official flowering process. So now we've got the duration of that could be anywhere, depending on your genetics and what you're doing, anywhere from really crazy low end with maybe CBD that you're trying not to let it get any THC down to maybe as low as six weeks. And on the high end, there are some strains that go above 10 or 11 or 12 weeks even, but kind of we believe the range for a lot of just your standard cannabis is going to be somewhere between eight and 10 weeks, let's say, to flower. And that's counting from the first day that you flip them. So now we're in flower and let's talk about what goes on in there. We follow, again, this is our method that we're using from 3 Light, and we've changed a few things and we we follow that. But again, there are a lot of people doing different stuff. But for us, the first day we go into flower, the very first thing we're going to do is defoliate those plants entirely. And so let's talk a little bit about what that is. It is scary. Uh, you'll, you won't do enough of it the first time you do it and you'll learn to do more. But it, it has a lot of benefits and we've decided after playing with it for a while um, that it is beneficial. And we would very rarely, unless an experiment dictated it, would we do a flower cycle without doing a defoliation at this point. Yeah, so defoliation is pretty easy uh, in concept, at least. And that is you remove every leaf from the plant. And uh, it's not actually possible to remove every single leaf from the plant without damaging the plant. But every mature leaf, every leaf that is full grown, you can easily chop off. 
any leaves that are half size, we generally chop off. We are only leaving the leaves that are so small and so immature that we can't get the scissors in to carefully cut just the leaf off without damaging the growing tip of the plant. Those are the only leaves we leave on. So we remove every mature leaf, every half mature leaf from the plant and take them down to just bare stems. It as Noah said, it's very scary, especially the first time you do it, you think you're going to kill the plant. And oftentimes uh, people hear of this technique and they will do it part way. They will remove all, but they'll leave one or three or four leaves per stem. And it, you don't get the same results as if you actually remove every single leaf. When you remove every single leaf, it's shocking the plant quite a bit into a number of different things. But Shocking the plant is actually not necessarily a bad thing, especially for a plant like cannabis, which is a annual plant. It dies after after it flowers. So if you can convince it that, hey, it's now flowering time and you'd better really flower because bad things are happening and you don't know how uh, likely you are to stay alive. The plant actually puts out more flowers than it would if it wasn't stressed. In addition, by removing every single leaf, it actually triggers those little tiny immature leaves that we had left on to really take off and explode in growth, much more so than if you left even just a single leaf per stem. Leaving mature leaves on there does not work as well as stripping every single leaf off. You're going to get better growth faster recovery and and this doesn't it's not intuitive, but we've seen it enough times you get better growth and faster recovery by removing all of the leaves from the plants and it's very aggressive it's uh, difficult to to see how it's not going to hurt the plant the first time but trust us if your plant was healthy going in you can strip every single leaf off and three days later you wouldn't even be able to tell that you had done that so that it, it is a big deal for us and we got to give credit where credit's due and we've gotten this technique that the schwas as they call it over at three alight it's um joshua hopped and that team kind of started this process and, and taught us a bit about it. And we've read his book and, and it is a technique that we believe in wholeheartedly at this point. So as, as Kevin explained that that's a critical step, that's day one. And everything he says applies to what I'm about to tell you about is we're going to do all of that all over again. So we're going to, um, yeah. Back up. Yeah. So just one other quick note on day one of, um, flower after removing all the leaves and, and letting the plant recover, at least dry its wounds a little bit. If you had any sort of insect problem or you want to make sure, just do a prophylactic spraying to make sure that there are no insects. After you stripped all the leaves off is the perfect time to spray the plant down with insecticide or uh, something like neem oil, which is generally what we do. We just spray the plants down with neem oil after defoliation because it's much easier to ensure that you're getting complete 100% coverage of the plant when you've just stripped most of its leaves off. It makes prophylactic spraying of the plant very easy, very fast. You don't end up going through so much uh, neem oil or whatever you're um, spraying on there. So just to make sure that we don't have spider mites, just to make sure that we don't have anything else, we generally spray down with neem oil immediately after defoliating the plants just to make sure because it's a lot easier spraying then and you don't want to have to be spraying later on in flower when you're actually going to be starting to damage the flowers themselves by spraying them. So that's the perfect time if you want to do a preventative spray, do it on day one of flower. So that's the end of uh, defoliation or schwas, um, as the guys at Three Light call it. Again, we do have to give credit where credit's due. We learned it from those guys, and they've really taken that process and fine-tuned it and created something that's really valuable for cannabis growers. And if you're not doing this in your garden, I recommend you give it a try. Just take one of your plants and go ahead and butcher it and see what you mm-hmm. find out because it is amazing, the results, and, and hats off to those guys for figuring that out. So now that you've done that, guess what? That's day one. We're going to do it all over again in day 21. Um, so as Kevin said, you've, you've done it. There's a, there are a few differences between day one and day 21. One of the key differences, one, we're not going to spray. Let's get that straight because as Kevin said, you've got flower sites now. Those flower sites also make the schwas or defoliation process much slower. So you got to get in there and you're going to get sticky. Hopefully you've got sticky flowers already. Um, and you're going to go in there and defoliate again. Now you've got to be careful. You don't want to cut flowers off. So it does slow the process down. It makes some leaves you can't get to, and that's fine. As Kevin explained with the first one, you're just going to get every leaf you can get to safely without damaging the plant or hurting it and get those leaves out. 
it's just going to be slower. Now, the other difference is obviously we're not spraying. We have flowers here. The other thing is we take advantage of this time, just like we took advantage of no leaves to spray, we're going to take advantage of no leaves to get a scrog net on there, something to support our plant. That does a few things. One, it allows better light penetration. We're going to kind of spread the plant out and kind of manipulate it, put it where we want it. Also, it gives the plant a, a physical support so that it feels comfortable putting more weight onto those branches. It feels supported and it's going to produce larger flowers. So we're going to take advantage of this time. We're going to do a full defoliation and this is going to take place at day 21, the end of week three. Technically, according to uh, Three Light, it's day 18 to 21, so you've got a little room to play with in there. And what you're really looking for is to get, you're trying to do this at the end of the stretch period because it doesn't help you to put a scrog net in or do things like that. If your plants are just going to continue to stretch, you'd have to throw another scrog net on it, which I don't personally like doing that. Well, and, and one of the key things to note here is that we are putting the scrog net on after we are tearing all the leaves off for the second time trying to remove the leaves from a plant that's actually being held up, even in a, something like a tomato cage, is infinitely more difficult than a plant that you can put on a table and just rotate in front of you. So we put up the support after we do the second defoliation. In addition, um, and this actually applies to day one of flower as well, but we will actually clean up the bottom of the plants. So any little side branches, uh, day one of flower, that are not going to be up in what we are going to call the canopy zone, we simply remove because those little branches are not going to be getting enough light. They're not going to get enough uh, of the hormones to actually generate big buds anyhow. And they're just going to be robbing the rest of the colas of energy and therefore it's going to hurt size and weight on the rest of those colas. So we remove everything and different people have different rules of thumb. Some people will say, oh, you remove the bottom third of the plant. It really depends on the total size of the plant and the total thickness of your canopy. Uh, the thickness of your canopy, on the other hand, is dictated by how close together the colas are going to be. And that's dependent on genetics and how you've trained the plant. So we generally try and aim for somewhere between a 12 and 24 inch thick canopy. That's the area that we're going to allow to have flower buds on it. Anything else that's outside of that range, lower than that canopy level, we strip off completely and just take it down to the bare branches. And we do that both on day one of flower as well as during the defoliation on day 18 to 21 of flower. Again, that's to divert the energy we were just talking about. We're trying to not waste energy on these lower branches that aren't going to develop any usable flower, any usable product. And we're trying to re-divert that to the canopy Kevin was talking about, really get that in there so we can get as much out of that well-maintained canopy as we can. And then when it does come time to actually support the plants and put up a scrog net, we try and ensure that we spread the plants out and the colas out as evenly as possible across the entire growing area as we can possibly get. So at day 18 to 21 of flower, your stretching should be mostly done. The branches are going to grow just a little bit more after this, but generally you've got a pretty good idea of exactly where all the branches are going to be as far as length, and you can very carefully distribute them in your netting so that you get one cola per square or two colas per square, but what we don't want is three colas in one square and then the next square over has nothing in it. That doesn't do you or the plant any good. You want to spread everything out as evenly as possible so that every cola gets its own slice of growing room, that it gets air movement and light in. So as we've talked about in the past with lights and LEDs specifically, and again, that's kind of more our expertise, is we specifically design our light to spread a nice, even canopy of light. And so you want that to meet a nice, even canopy of plants. You know, other companies use secondary lenses or things like that. And then you might want to focus your plants kind of in the center because all of their lights really focused in the center. It makes their numbers look good on paper, but they don't have an even canopy of uh, light that's hitting the, the surface area. So we want to create an even canopy of plants with all the topping and what Kevin's talking about with the scrog net. And then our light will give you the best results if you can get that even canopy because we're going to give you light and hit all those squares. And as Kevin said, your goal is to get one cola in every square. We think a perfect canopy is if you have no empty spots. And to be honest, we always have empty spots. It's just kind of a goal to shoot for, right? You're always shooting for that perfection. But you do want that even canopy because we're going to give you a very even canopy of light out of our uh, out of our grow lights. And so we want to kind of have those two meet up and give you the best production you can get. 
So after uh, two to eight weeks of vegetative growth where we're constantly topping and training the plants and repotting and then more uh, training plants and tearing leaves off uh, for the first three weeks of flower, once we're actually in the scrog net and everything is distributed out, the grow gets much easier from there. <laughs> Pretty much just switch in to uh, watch the plants grow and, and keep feeding them and fertilizing them. Uh, but from then on, we don't actually do any further training other than continuing to clean up any little buds that are trying to grow too low on the plants. And obviously, if you're running into issues with colas bending or breaking or getting too tall, you can do a little bit of training in there. But if we did everything right to begin with and we got everything nice and flat, we got the canopy as even as possible, it generally means that once we finally get them in the scrog net, that's the end of all of our plant training uh, that we need to do for the rest of the grow. Yeah, and so also keep in mind, he's, he mentioned you know feeding and fertilizing, and we don't want to spend a bunch of time on that because that is a whole separate topic. But you do need to properly feed your plants. I mean, our lights are incredibly important, but we will not argue the fact that nutrients are as important, if not more so. So picking a good nutrient line, following the instructions, using proper procedures for watering and flushing and making sure you don't end up with salt buildups and burns, those are all critical. And I recommend you jump back to our podcast if you want to learn a bit more about that uh, and so you can get the real skinny on that. But feeding is important. And we haven't talked a lot about um, in flower and veg too much about environment, but let's touch on that real quickly. You know, we have some slightly different recommendations based on our spectrum of our lights and how our lights work and how they affect your plants. So in the old days, uh, kind of the 75, 78 degree range was, you know, no CO2, uh, 75 with HPS, maybe 75 degrees Fahrenheit with lights on as your ambient temperature, and then 78 if you were running CO2. We need to turn that up. So we recommend if you go to our site and you read, you're going to see we recommend 84 without CO2, 88 with CO2. And those, again, are targets. You can kind of play around those areas. But that is critical to understand. And if you do use the 70 degree temps with our lights, it's not going to kill anything, but you will diminish your yields. And that's obviously something none of us want to do with our gardens. So that's your your temperature and humidity uh, is critical as well. Yeah. And, and one key thing to note there is we recommend 84 to 88 degrees uh, with the lights on. When the lights are off, we actually recommend the same nighttime temperatures that people would normally use for any other kind of light, because when the lights are off, the plants are not feeling the light at all. And, and so doesn't make any difference what kind of light you're using so 65 to 70 degrees different people have different ideas um, and even different strains you might want to keep cooler at night but nights light off temp uh, the lights off temperature at night uh, is not affected by the spectrum of our lights. But while the lights are on, you want to run 10 degrees warmer than you would with high pressure sodium or the plants are just not going to yield as well as they should for you. So that's a little bit about environment. Obviously, there's other things you really should consider. Uh, a, a quick way to get an idea of what we recommend is you, even if you don't need one of our kits, go take a look at our kit uh, page, one of our complete kits. And if you go to the bottom, you'll find a video. Uh, we, we show how we set it up. So Again, even if you don't need a kit, you can see kind of what we consider a good growing environment. Things like oscillating fans in there, temperature and humidity control. Those things are all covered there. So you do want to pay attention to those. You know, when we give our weights that we tell our lights can get, we say it requires good genetics, a good grower, and a good environment. Environment is key, and we're kind of lumping the environment and the nutrients and all the plant care into that. But those are incredibly important if you want to hit good yields and good quality. So now, as Kevin said, we've gone through all that period of veg time, all the topping. We've gone through two defoliations. We've been in flower now. Let's say we're at week 10. A lot of the R&D stuff we do is 10 weeks. So you get to the end of flower. Now, some people do things, and we do play around with those, such as a 24-hour dark period the day before you take down, or slowly dropping temperatures, or even hitting your roots with cold water. Those are things you can play with and things I'd recommend looking into. But again, we don't want to do a deep dive. But just be aware there are things some people do to bring out colors and or try production right at the end of flower and those are out there but generally we're gonna everyone should be flushing out if you're in soil maybe one to two weeks if you're in hydro you can do it faster but you should be flushing the nutrients out so you don't end up with harsh uh, cannabis when you take down and now we're going to take down our plants and that's obviously one of the most fun rewarding parts of the process but it's also in some ways one of the easier ones technically but one of the most labor intensive so what we mean by that is you're going to take your plants down put them into something clean that you can move them away from your garden go sit on the couch go sit at a table and you're going to trim up all of your flower now plan for a lot more time than you think and there are plenty of people that like to hang it and dry it and trim it on the flower 
uh, once it's dry. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. We just happen to be ones that trim wet and then go to dry after that. So there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat as well, whether you want to trim dry, trim wet. But you're going to take it down really quickly here. What you're going to do is you're going to do a dry period where all you're trying to do is slowly get the moisture out. You don't want to do it too quickly. Your target should be 7 to 14 days. You're going to slowly dry in a room with humidity and as cool as possible. We run around 64 degrees Fahrenheit for that. And then once it's got to the dryness you want, where you want to kind of hold it, then you're going to get it into a jar and let it go through the cure process. And that's a bit longer. That's going to be more like three to four weeks. And you're letting some of the plant material break down and you're allowing that chlorophyll taste to go out, getting rid of that kind of hay, cut grass taste and smell, and letting the good smells and flavors come out as the, as things go ahead and progress and cure up in that jar. You want to keep that out of direct sunlight and, again, relatively cool because terpenes, all the good flavors and smells do evaporate at a fairly low temperature. So hopefully you've completed your grow, you've got some good weight, and uh, you've learned a lot. And just to be clear, if this is your first grow that you're attempting, if you get even a gram of usable flour at the end of the day, you're actually doing pretty good. A lot of people don't make it through their first grow on their first try. Something happens, it's catastrophic. They newt the plants wrong or do something weird and just ruin their plants over water and whatever. So if you get through with even a gram or two, you're, you're winning and you will get much better every grow. You will progress and your skills will get better. Kevin, are there any other tips that you throw out that are critical for maybe a beginner grower or somebody that's setting up and getting their first garden going? If they don't have our kit and they don't have all those parts, anything you could recommend as far as other than, you know, overwatering and sizing up plants and pots into, into the appropriate sizes that we could throw out as real tips for these new growers? Uh, generally, I think one of the more common f- issues I see with first-time growers is people that are a little bit uh, too concerned about how things are going. And they see some little symptom of something on a leaf and they try and make a change. And they might make three or four changes in three or four days and people overreact and the plants will grow themselves. All you have to do is support that. They will grow themselves. There's a reason people call it weed. It does grow like a weed if you uh, if you let it. A lot of people will get in there and they'll try and change too much too quickly all at once. And then it becomes difficult to decipher, Okay, which change was it that actually caused the problem they're seeing? And the answer is probably it's a combination of all of them. But if you do see an issue, make a change to try and fix it if you think you need to fix it and then wait a few days to see if it's actually fixed it. A lot of people will keep piling on new things or they'll get on the internet or they'll go to a local store and they'll ask, okay, what do I need to spray for this and that? And honestly, the answer is usually simpler than a lot of people think it is. Um, So for example, if you get insects on there, you can go to your local store and they will give you all sorts of different recommendations for what insecticides might work for that kind of insect. In general, though, the simplest answer, and I've come to this through many, many years, is if it's not a flying insect, you can kill it 100% of the time with vegetable oil. Insects don't have lungs. They can't breathe with uh, lungs like we do. They breathe through their skin. Applying a layer of oil to them completely suffocates them, and there's no way they can evolve resistance to that. It is completely non-toxic to you. It is non-toxic to the plant if you do it in the right way. So... Neem oil is by far the best general purpose insecticide. Don't recommend spraying it during flower, not because it's going to hurt the flowers necessarily or hurt the plant, but it will wash some of the um, THC and CBD and the oils off of the plant because it's literally dissolving it in another oil. So we generally try and avoid spraying during flower, but... If you have insect issues, try and take care of them during veg. Neem oil works great. Um, if it is a flying insect, you, depending on what kind of insect it is, something like uh, thrips, spinosad works very well and is very non-toxic to humans. Uh, it's even organic or can be organic, uh, just like neem oil. So there are options out there. I see all the time where people are, are doing what I think are, are crazy things. Um, they heard that, oh, spraying your plant down with alcohol will take care of the insects. Well, it will, but it'll also probably kill the plant if you do it wrong. So don't uh, don't read up too much, too many different things on the Internet um, and don't try too many different things at once. 
And stay away from those nasty chemicals. Yeah. They're great natural things you can use and not, not woo-woo stuff, but legitimate natural stuff that you're not going to be smoking, things you don't want to smoke down the road. Uh, so that covers it for today. It's a bit of a long one. Thank for st- thanks for sticking around with us. Um, we appreciate you coming and listening today. We hope you enjoyed this installment of Cultivation Cast. Again, just to remind you, if you have any questions on the content of this or any previous one, or please, if you have suggestions of things you want to learn about, please go ahead and shoot us an email at podcast at black dog LED. And again, thanks for joining us and happy gardening. <laughs>